We are live. Only a few minutes late tonight. Sorry for being a little late on the uptake here. But we are here and ready to talk about some science. Are you all ready for some science? I think we have some fun stories tonight. I think we're good. There's no identity four, so that bat signal I was just waiting for is not coming. <laughs> <laughs> Truth. <laughs> it's truth. Oh, everyone's okay. Hello, the chat room says they see us. <gasps> we see you. Hello. So we are beginning the show in a three, a two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 757, recorded on Wednesday, February 5th, 2020. Life on Earth. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight we will fill your head with a clap, a school, and violence. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. As a novel pneumonia-inducing virus races around the world, outpacing confinement efforts, as governments, media markets, and healthcare workers react, as the number of infected continue to grow, and as scientists work overtime to construct a vaccine, something to keep in mind. It is well within our power to deal with this emergency, as with many other potential threats to human health. Through the ongoing investments we have made in education, research, and our public health systems. Without the public investment, we would be unprepared to identify that an outbreak was even occurring. Without the public investment, we would be unprepared to discover the source of the outbreak. Without the public investment, we would be unprepared to react quickly and in an effective manner. Without the public investment, we would be unprepared to survive this and many more lethal events. We are in this together, this world, this life, this experiment called humanity. And in a very direct way, nothing makes this more clear than a pandemic that can cross all borders we set between us. That and This Week in Science, coming up next. Why isn't it working? Oh, because I have it turned down. Hold on. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Yeah to Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair, and to you, our listener out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about all the science that we found this week that we're excited about and that piqued our interest, made us ask more questions. <sighs> Thank you so much for joining us. All right, I have stories about biodiversity. Got a story, a bunch of stories, a couple of stories about life on Earth, hence the title of the show. I've also got some some bees. Got some bees in the house and um, cats. We're going to talk about cats. Oh. That's going to happen. Huh. Yeah. yeah, Justin, cats what'd you bring? Uh, I've got uh, uh, homeless schooling. Uh, violent evolution and a coronavirus update. All right. As is good, we should keep updating that story as it is ongoing for people, and the science is ongoing too. Blair, what is in the animal corner? I have clapping seals. Oh, the clap. I, mm. yep. The, the okay. seal clapping. Yes. Okay. I have, <laughs> I have foodie cuttlefish. And I have some spider glue. Always nice to talk about some spider glue. Mm -hmm. That's not what I was expecting you were going to say. Spider glue, spider glue. What about, yeah, what? Spider webs, but not glue. The glue. Okay. The glue that makes them stick the web sticky? Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll find out. We'll find out. We, yeah, yeah, we will yeah. find out. There's okay. time, Kiki. I'm... Well, we can get there. We'll get there. I know. Okay. I, I hope that. You can wait. I can wait. We can wait. As we jump into the show, though, I would like you to know that 
Next week, we will not be broadcasting live on Wednesday night because we will be doing two live shows at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, that's AAAS, meeting in Seattle, Washington. First on Friday. Yeah, one on Friday at 12.30 p.m., another on Saturday the 15th at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Time. We will try to broadcast those, but the episodes will be published as podcast episodes. The shows will be published as podcast episodes for those of you who listen to the podcast. You can tell your friends to subscribe to Twist to get that podcast on iTunes, the Google Play Podcast Portal, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, Pandora, TuneIn, all the good places for podcasts. You can also tell them to find us on YouTube and Facebook by searching for This Week in Science or just visiting twist.org. But now it's time for the science. Did she say now it's time for the science and then freeze? I think that she did. <laughs> I thought she was just pausing for effect. Like she might still be. There's a chance that we're ruining the anticipation when she unfreezes and launches right into her first story. Uh, all right, Kiki, are you done with your dramatic pause? <laughs> no. This no? will happen Why? again. Oh, yeah. This is not the it's... last technical difficulty twist will ever. No, ever this will happen again in exactly one hour. Mark the time. It is... Now 8.15, it will happen again. I will go silent. Sorry about that, everyone. Anyway, it's time for the science. Is that one of the last things you heard me say? Did yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then we were all waiting. <laughs> In fact, we still are. <laughs> we're still waiting. Keep you waiting all night. No. Let's talk about biodiversity. Oh, yes. Yeah, this story I thought was really very interesting. It's out of uh, one of the places that's published out of uh, is the Monterey Bay Aquarium, mm. which Mbari, Mbari, yes, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. The researchers have come together with many other researchers, uh, national governmental organizations around the world to create a. A, a very global interdisciplinary attempt at understanding biodiversity around the world. So what they came to understand is that there are people who work on life on land and there are people who work on ocean life, but they don't talk to each other very much. Mm -hmm. And so you have this distribution of animal life that is set to these disparate quadrants when in fact there is a lot of overlap and there are environmental factors that come from land and influence biodiversity in the ocean there are factors from the ocean that influence biodiversity on land and the researchers decided they needed to come together to map out the diversity of life the biodiversity of our planet terrestrially and in the marine ecosystems to figure out where life is and what allows it to be there mm -hmm. it's pretty it's a pretty interesting question and a a, a a laudable goal for to be sure and so they looked at around 67,000 species of animals around the world to be able to get a picture of where these animals were, during what times of year, why they were there, what was going on, what factors were involved in their distribution. And they also, they used artificial intelligence and natural learning models to come to predict where, based on what they saw in the various species, try and predict and tease out the factors that would tell them where species should be. And a lot of the times the models were quite right. However, a few times they determined that the models were very wrong in predicting lots of species where in fact there are not lots of species, where there's not a lot of biodiversity. And so in doing this, it's telling them 
what they're getting right and understanding about what allows life to exist in certain places and what doesn't allow it to exist in others. These, uh, these observed richness patterns, um, they've, they found something that I thought was pretty, pretty interesting in that they determined that their ecological mechanisms like geographic isolation and structural complexity. So for instance, um, a, a more complex sea bottom, whether it's flat and there's nothing on it versus lots of coral and lots of rocks and things that are on the bottom of the ocean that make it a very structurally complex ecosystem. They can explain residuals in the models and also identify regions and processes that might deserve more attention later at the global global scale. And what they eventually want to be able to do is improve their models and improve their estimates so that they will be able to take the changing climate and predict where animals are going to be in the future and not just predict where they're going to be so that we can fish them or we can hunt mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. but so that we can create plans of action for actually potentially conserving them and being good stewards for all the life on the planet. Yeah, I mean, we have these things called national parks and preserves and things like that on land. In yeah. the ocean, we have marine protected areas, but the amount of oceans that are protected are way less than the amount of lands that are protected by percentage. And so um, I think that finding kind of the the common ground between those two areas is, is super important. I also think it's interesting looking at that figure that there was expected richness where there wasn't. And I'm just so curious based on their data, what time frame their data is from. And if perhaps yeah. that is an area where there was species richness and we and dumped a bunch of chemicals in the water or overfished in that area or have a huge amount of noise pollute. You know, there's like a million things right. mm -hmm. that could be happening in those spaces because those middle areas of the planet are also where there's a lot of humans. <laughs> yeah. So, it, you know, all these places where there's a lot of biodiversity, there's also humans in those spaces. So mm -hmm. we're part of that equation. Absolutely. Yeah, That's a really good, uh, really good observation. Yeah. I also, I also wonder, yeah, not just us, but then we also know like there's the the big dead zone off the coast of Oregon that keeps coming back, Oregon and California, the hypoxic, mm -hmm. hypoxic, yes, the, or anoxic, where the oxygen just gets depleted, um, if areas like that are taken into account into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but they looked at uh, a number of, uh, a number of species ranges that were published. Uh, according to the paper here, it looks as though they were looking at distribution of birds, amphibians, and mammals from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and BirdLife International. They've also queried the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, Fish Base, the Jelly Base, Jellyfish Database Initiative, and the International Union for the Conservation of the Nature for Fish. Um, yeah, so it looks as though they've just been looking at distribution and potentially not taken, and, and that's going to, going to have been, all that data will have been collected over a, a variety of timescales. So changes absolutely may have taken place. Yeah, but those are very interesting questions. And from that study of our, this new goal of kind of looking at the earth in a holistic manner and not just like you said looking at hey we have preserves we've got this area we're preserved and it's great life in there is fantastic looking at it as oh my gosh we have preserves but sometimes animals leave those areas and what happens then right how do we start looking at the systems and not just these smaller puzzle pieces within mm -hmm. them 
And in so, uh, in doing that, there is a an instrument that was launched to the International Space Station in June 2018. It is called EcoStress. <sighs> this sounds stands for Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer on Space Station. <laughs> and EcoStress is super cool because what it looks at is uh, transpiration, evo tra evo transpiration evapotranspiration, sorry, where plants, as they wake up in the morning, they have these pores in their, in their surfaces that open. And as they start photosynthesizing, they start taking in oxygen, taking in carbon dioxide, giving off carbon dioxide. The gas exchange is this evaporation, transpiration process, evapotranspiration. And so they've looked at the same place at multiple times during the day because the orbit of the space station is such that allows the space station to go, the space station goes around the planet multiple times every day. And in doing that, it can look at the same lo locations, yet at different times of the day. And when it is looking at these different times of the day, it can see how the plants are breathing and how they are <laughs> acting during the day from space. And this is just, just brilliant. What they have found um, during this process, there's also water loss, the evapotranspiration uh, leads to plant sweating. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another aspect of that, um, that the that the instrument is able to analyze. And they looked at morning data for the summer season, and they found that near the Great Lakes, they had a, a near Lake Superior, plants near the water woke up first in the mornings. <laughs> yeah. And they had, um, they have, put the images that they've taken from the multiple measurements on top of each other to be able to show how plants change their activity in this one particular area over the day. And plants that are closer to the lake are in a red color, and then there's another green color and a blue color in this image. And what it is indicating is different. The colors are, in, are not indicating different amounts of acti activity, but different times of activity. And so it's almost as if there's a wave of of plant awareness of the environment that that takes place from the shore of the lake further into land. Now the question is, why does that happen? Does it have yeah, to do with on? Yeah, is it lake heating or cooling effects? Is it, um, you know, is, are there lake of, it, that, well, that's the, the thing I would immediately think is that there are lake effects that would keep that area cooler or give the plants different different activity. I don't know. Yeah, Kevin, or, are you, they, or are they reacting to something else in their environment that's being activated? Like, is it a... Hmm. Oh, yeah, like become, the domino effect. Yeah. 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 Do bacteria become more active in a certain moisture environment there? Or is it uh, insects uh, are becoming more active? Or, well, didn't or we talk on the show about um, fog carrying bacteria? That's right. Yeah. So coastal fog, this this kind of push of the of 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 um, evaporated uh, liquid from the bay could kind of push not just water, but other things into those areas on, right on the edges. And yeah. Yeah. So eco stress, it's a, it's a cool instrument that's allowing us to see the planet breathing <laughs> in effect, these plants waking so up cool. as the sun comes around. Yeah. The main questions that eco stress is trying to address are 
How is the terrestrial biosphere responding to changes in water availability? How do changes in diurnal vegetation water stress impact the global carbon cycle? And can agricultural vulnerability be reduced through advanced monitoring of agricultural water consumptive use and improved drought estimation? So I think that'll also be a very interesting aspect of uh, of this instrument is being able to tell us a lot more about agriculture, not just not just wild plants, but agriculture and drought influences. That's, I think, going to be very interesting to see how that how that plays out. All these eyes from space, I think that they are going, they're giving us such an amazing new view of our planet. Mm -hmm. Love it. I love it too. Justin, do you have a story? Uh, Yeah, this is a representative survey of undergraduate and graduate students at North Carolina State University. They took, uh, it's a campus of 36,000, but they had 1,923 students participate in the study. And they found that almost 10% of the students had experienced homelessness in the previous year. And that more than 14% dealt with food insecurity in the previous month to taking the survey. Uh, This is quoting Mary Haskett, professor of psychology at North Carolina State, who is the first author Uh, of the uh, study. We knew that our student body was facing these challenges and that understanding the scope of the problems is a first step towards addressing them. Researchers, uh, so they found, the researchers found 9.6% of survey respondents reported experiencing episodes of homelessness in the previous year, which could have been, uh, the meaning that they had placed to that could have been as little as one night of not having any place to sleep. And then the 14.8% percent that said they were food insecure in the previous month is actually something that has got a scale, uh, technically uh, termed by the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And there's a 10-item inventory within this survey for food insecurity, which uh, the two of the questions on that, they do an overall calculation of the 10 to come up with the 14.8 percent as being uh, labeled food insecure. Uh, so for example, two of the questions 20.6% of students were worried about not being able to afford food, at least some of the time, while 9.9% of students had actually gone hungry because they could not afford food. Uh, quoting, uh, it's a tricky thing uh, place to place these numbers in context nationally because while there have been efforts in the nonprofit sector to collect this data on college students and homelessness and food insecurity, There has not been much peer-reviewed research that has actually been published, says Haskett. Uh, The survey has helped make a difference at North Carolina State. The survey data provided an impetus for the university to launch uh, several new programs, including small grants and meal swipes, which I'm assuming is something to do with their cafeteria, to assist students with emergency food needs. So it's kind of a horrible story. You know... Part of it is we know that students go into pretty extreme debt these days at American campuses. Uh, and I'm wondering if these uh, are students who just ran out of the ability to borrow or ran through what they've been borrowing already or weren't av- uh, able to borrow. But uh, it is just sort of a sta- sad state of affairs that we have a nation that is not investing in the future generation uh, of students. Uh, and allowing allowing this sort of situation to develop. Hopefully the study gets more attention, more universities uh, hopefully look at this. One of the side notes is they said that it, they thought it was unusual for a state university to have these high levels, but they acknowledged that in the community college level, uh, this was common. This was would not have been a surprising uh, result. Uh, and in fact, it may have been a lower result than what you might expect to get. Uh, but it's a... Uh, understudied issue, which is kind of interesting because you would think at a university setting, there's room to study just about anything that somebody would want to take up. Uh, and this sounds like it could be pretty a pretty important thing. Uh, this so- Yeah, it sounds like it's an incredibly important issue. And you hear stories about uh, grad students living in their cars or... 
um, you know, people living underneath their desks in the lab or you know, doing whatever they can to make ends meet. And the truth of it is not everybody gets grants, scholarships, mm -hmm. loans. They, you know, either for the for the grants and the scholarships, you know, they don't they're highly competitive and potentially you don't they get just them don't every get them. year too yeah yeah just because you yeah. get them one year doesn't mean you get them the next year so you could enroll right. in a school having gotten some scholarships and not be guaranteed that you'll have them the next year i remember specifically being surprised at how much books cost and the fact that those are not covered by scholarships unless you specifically got a scholarship for books and so i could totally see having to buy a $200 textbook and suddenly losing your food budget for the month. That makes yeah, perfect so, yeah. sense to me. It, well, it makes yeah. perfect sense that this happens, but of course yeah. it doesn't make perfect sense that it happens no. in a global no. superpower with the no. financial resources right. that no. this nation has. So this is obviously, <laughs> right. this is obviously a problem. I mean, and you know, the, 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 when I look at something like this, the first thing that occurs to me is what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Uh, world that uh, we are building where we're pushing people away from higher education, where we're making it this prohibitive that the less and less people can afford to safely and securely gain an education. Because for all of these studies, of, or this, for all of the people in this study, this 10% who were homeless and the 14, 15% that were having food insecurity, how many people say, yeah, not worth it? Uh, not this year, not, not this I time mean around. I, I get I get it. I went to a state school. So I went to one of the cheapest colleges I could possibly go to for my bachelor's degree. I had a part time job. I got scholarships. I got loans and my parents got loans. And it took me 10 years to pay that off. Mm -hmm. And that was the cheapest possible school I could go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I get it. <laughs> That's, yeah. It's, and if you it's, don't want it's a struggle. And if you don't want to go into debt then you make choices not to, um, or perhaps maybe your money is going other places. Maybe you have medical bills that your family's having to pay and, or, and they can't afford, you know, and maybe, uh, maybe according to everybody, they make enough money and so don't qualify for the, for the lower interest loans or for, you know, there are so many factors that go into it. And you're right, Justin, how many people decide oh, how many are completely turned away and don't yeah. go through that at all. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure just about everyone knows of people or has, you know, either or been that person who's struggled through a quarter or semester of school because they were trying to make ends meet so that they could do something that would give them a leg up in their future career. Um, this is definitely something that needs to be studied. It's something that, uh, you know, there are these movements to make education free for for uh, states to provide mm -hmm. higher education free of charge mm -hmm. to people. And if you didn't have to pay tuition, if you didn't have to, uh, or if it were easier to get money for books, perhaps it would make it easier for more people to be able to make that choice and to step into higher education and not be pushed away. Yeah. I mean, there's a real weird thing going on where the the amount that the cost of college has raised in the past several decades it's in relation so to the per, to how the percentage that pay has gone up is yeah. so it's out of whack. Unrelated. Well, and, and the same can be said for housing. You know, it's, yeah, it's, totally. all, it's also one of my fears when I mean, I'm all for uh, the, the proposals that are out there that uh, create funds to pay for higher education, uh, to take it off the debt, burden, to take it out of the hands of the banks and make it something we do collectively as a society. Totally for it. Um, the one concern I have is I've already noticed that college towns tend to have much more expensive housing than other yeah. places uh, because as you have uh, you have people who you know are going to be coming in and renting and want to be close to facilities because they may not have Lots vehicles and everything. turnover, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's one of those, uh, the first thing that uh, one of the candidates, uh, 
name people, but is proposing also a flat fund that everybody gets. And the first thing I think is app that rent will just go up that much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like everybody who's paying right. rent, their rent will just go up by the amount of this <laughs> this subsidy. So we have to we have it has to be a housing thing too. I mean, I know uh, this is going off a little bit too far on this, but the UC Davis behind UC Davis, an area that the the campus has expanded to uh, into. They've massively expanded with student run housing because the city of Davis, the housing here has become prohibitively expensive, whether you're working full time or not. Yeah. And so they're trying to they've been trying to tackle this issue themselves by creating a huge amount of housing for their students. Uh, but it does take the actual communities uh, like this university that's creating a food program for it. it's going to take it, the universities themselves to identify that they need to take better care of their main client, which is these, these students. The and students. That they can utilize some of their resources to further uh, the security, health, and housing of their own students. As a society, I think yeah. we should all be involved, but I think on the campus level, there could be uh, maybe a smaller football stadium next time around and, <laughs> and a little bit more affordable housing for your students. Just saying. Just think about it. Just think about it a little bit more. That's right. All right. Well, we have uh, beaten that horse a little bit, I think. <laughs> yeah. If you've tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. And if you're interested in a twist shirt or mug or other item of twist merchandise, Head over to twist.org and click on the Zazzle link to browse our store. Do you know what time it is right now? What time is it? Hmm. <laughs> Speaking of horses, haha, -ha, it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. <gasps> I like that part of the show. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And I'm no What you got, Blair? Oh, my goodness. I have two of the most amazing stories. This is a great week for animal science, I got to say. Um, first, yeah. how would either of you, as in as a human, try to communicate with another human I am strong, stay away, or I am strong, my genes are good. Would it be the same thing? Would it be different things? What it would be think? different. One sounds it more, yeah, I think one is much more yelly than the other one. Yeah, so one is yelly, the other is, I don't know, maybe more sensual. Well, <laughs> if you're a gray seal, <laughs> they both might be the same. Uh, and they might confusing. be clapping. <laughs> well, I guess if you've got one move. Yeah, that's your one move. You use it for everything. Uh, this is a stu new study actually finding that seals can clap underwater. Which, mm. next time you're in a swimming pool... <laughs> Go ahead and try that real quick. I have tried it. It's not easy. The water no. gets in between your hands and you're like, I'm going to push the done. water out of the way. There's lots of and... matter in the way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this was captured in footage, which took 17 years of diving to catch. And um, this researcher, naturalist Dr. Ben Burville, a researcher with Newcastle University in the UK, caught a male gray seal clapping its paw, and it sounded like a gunshot-like crack. It really just sounds kind of like a loud clap. Um, and so this raises many questions. <laughs> the first one being, as we were just talking about, how do you make a loud clap sound underwater when you have no air to compress between the flippers of all that water in the way it is uh we're not sure exactly how they do it i guess they're just very strong and very effective at it um more study is needed for that in particularly but these loud clapping sounds cut through the background noise underwater 
and send a clear signal to other seals in the area. So they think this is like a chest beating of a male gorilla, which is the I am strong, stay away, or I am strong, my genes are good. So saying both, I am a dominant male, other males, get out of it. Later, here I am. <laughs> so it appears that this clapping could be important social behavior, which also means that if there is noise pollution, that could be a problem. Uh, yeah, get in the way. Yes. <clears throat> I, I so like the idea, too, that, that the clapping. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> could make, like, make him, uh, like if it was, it's anthropomorphic, that it's clapping like applause. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, you know, your opponents are like, oh, well, you know what? Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. I guess I won't oh, fight you. Yeah. You're paying oh. me a nice compliment. And then to, to anybody else, to anyone you're trying to attract, it's like, oh, they think I'm funny. Oh. Or I think I'm good at this. Oh, okay. Yes. I like that. Oh, yes. Oh, keep at it. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so but the instead. Yes. It's, so, it's, so, yeah. Instead, it sounds a little bit oh. different. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a good clap. Do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Clap, clap. Clap, clap, clap. Clap, clap. So is this is this something the, that that uh, maybe you already said it? Is this something specifically males are doing? Yes. Okay. Uh, of course, it's only been caught on film. I think this one time so far, but it just seems very um, deliberate, and yeah. other seals were responding to it. So the other thing that's interesting about this is that for over a hundred years seals in circuses and in zoos have been trained to clap, which is interesting because I think humans, their own hubris this whole time have assumed that we taught them to do that. But this kind of leads us to believe mm. that perhaps this is a behavior that kind of already exists, which animal training in general, it's so much easier when the behavior already kind of exists and you're just reinforcing it for some exactly other, yeah. yeah so i was this just this evening i was trying to teach my puppy to shake and it's really hard to get that behavior for the first time but she also likes to bat at things with her paws so i had to try to elicit that behavior and if i could elicit that behavior then it's much easier for her to go oh when she does this hand signal she wants my hand because yeah. she's offering it up on her own me shaping that behavior from scratch is really really difficult unless you can build on something that already exists so Seals doing this in the wild actually makes perfect sense for how people could train seals to clap so easily for so long. Because also we have to remember that about 100 years ago, our understanding of how to train animals was so out of whack with what we understand now <laughs> that being able to do it so successfully and consistently, there's a good chance something there is a vestige from wild Behavior. behavior so it yeah. makes perfect sense to me um but it is interesting that it took 17 years to catch this it's possible that seeing humans around the seals aren't doing it because there's another element they're not worried about the other seals around and it's possible that this guy having spent 17 years diving maybe a particular group of seals is like oh yeah that's just our buddy <laughs> We know like, him. That's oh, great. Dr. Yeah. Ben. Yeah, he's just hanging out. Um, but this, this is a good reminder that if we don't know a behavior exists, we can't protect it. And so before we knew that seals were using this behavior to communicate, we wouldn't know that it's something that we'd have to be careful about with noise pollution. But we do know that marine mammals in general use sound signals. They call. So it's not that too hard to believe but yeah. yeah yeah i can make your hands clap 
There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hip. Um, <laughs> so next, I have my favorite story of the week about cuttlefish. Cuddle I as am... in you want to cuddle them. Cuttle. cuttle I know. Cuttle, cuttle. These are these are the amazing magicians of camouflage or, or yes, uh, and, environment and adaption can, and and they can solve puzzles and recognize patterns and do deduction and they're just so special. Well, there's something new that we can add to that uh, kind of resume of how cuttlefish are amazing, and it is that they have a capacity that I often lack, which is the ability to make decisions based on future expectations, such as eating less for lunch when you know there's a fancy dinner coming. Oh, oh. I have problems with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, there's there's a fancy dinner coming. Why did I go to the Chinese buffet for uh -huh. lunch? <laughs> Researchers tested 29 cuttlefish five times a day for five days to find their favorite food. They offered crab, they offered shrimp, they had them at equal distances and watched what they went for first. And all cuttlefish love shrimps. They love their shrimps. Um, and so after knowing that, they were able to test cuttlefish's ab uh, ability to recognize certain patterns in what food was offered to them. So when researchers reliably provided shrimp in the evening, cuttlefish were much more selective during the day and ate significantly fewer and i re i read this wrong the first time i read it i read they they ate significantly fewer carbs if only i could do that no 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 they ate significantly fewer crabs <laughs> <laughs> so they were like oh I'm, I'm skipping the the crab for lunch because i want to eat that shrimp later i'm going to save up when they were provided with shrimp on a random basis the cuttlefish would become opportunistic and eat more crabs, not carbs, during the day. <laughs> so they were able to remember patterns of food availability and therefore optimize foraging activity to guarantee not only that the volume of food that they were eating was enough, but that they could eat more of the foods they prefer. So this flexible foraging strategy shows that cuttlefish can adapt quickly to changes in their environment and their the availability of food in their environment using previous experience. They can build on that. And this shows valuable insight into the evolutionary origins of complex cognitive ability, as we often say with the cephalopods, is that if they have these very complex problem-solving skills, there's a good chance there is a common ancestor that shared that. And cephalopods and vertebrates diverged around 550 million years ago. So if we are going with that theory, that is some old knowledge. Now, I'm not so sure about that because also other vertebrates are definitely not as smart as cuttlefish. So I also <laughs> am willing to think that perhaps they are super smart in a convergent evolution pathway where they're just really good at similar stuff to higher vertebrates because they both have evolved as the smarties in their habitat. Yeah. There's a, there's definitely a, a natural selection advantage uh, mm -hmm. to being smart. I'm definitely just a survival thinking, edge to it. I just kind of had an interesting thought. So we were talking earlier about biodiversity and comparing biodiversity on land in terrestrial environments versus in aquatic environments in the water. And I was thinking about the evolution of hominids and how they were kind of this quote unquote higher intelligence pathway that we got in terrestrial habitats. What if cephalopods were the mirror image for the aquatic environment? So in, because there were so many invertebrates in, in the, um, in the, that first, or invertebrates, in that first kind of uh, ra uh, radiation of evolution for, of the, all the invertebrates, of all the starfish and, and jellyfish and octopuses and all this kind of stuff that just exploded, right? So that was this huge 
explosion of species in the oceans. What if the the cuttlefish and the and the octopus and the squid are this arm of evolutionary history in oceans that are this kind of terminus of like the smartest and most evolved? It's possible, right? It's possible. Yeah. I mean, we're as possible. Justin I mean, often says, we're all the same evolved, right, in terms of time. But I mean, the, yeah, the like mammals... We all, we all had as much time to get here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the mammals are still pretty smart in the ocean. Right, but know. they started on land and then went back, went back to, the, to the, ocean. the ocean. Right, so, but these are just the animals mm -hmm. who stayed, the inverts who stayed in the water. Sorry. I'm just wondering. Yeah. It's, just... it's an interesting question, but I... Yeah, I mean, this is a this study is very interesting, and I'm noting that one of the authors on the paper is my advisor from oh. my PhD. Uh, That's she is fun. Co, uh, she's the co senior uh, PI on the paper, Nicola Clayton, mm. and we did studies. I was involved in helping her uh, as a a lab tech and as a, uh, a graduate student, helping her do very similar studies with. Uh, with scrub jays. And we were looking at the idea of episodic memory and this question of whether birds could remember specific time, place, cues, and contexts to be able to, you know, pretty much answer the question of who, what, the questions of who, what, when, where, and why, you know, these, episo these episodes in their lives. And the initial experiments that we did were very similar th to this, just looking at preferences for wax worms versus um, kibble dog food and giving changing the availability from different times of the day. And the, the birds acted very similarly, where they changed the way they consumed because they had this... Because th what this shows is it's not just selective foraging behavior, it's also time dependent. It's also an awareness that there is time. And so there is memory involved. And there's an understanding by what we would call a what we would consider a very simplistic invertebrate, right? Mm -hmm. An understanding that there is a later, that there mm -hmm. is a will be. Well, this is like the, the marshmallow test for that we've uh -huh. done. Right. Is the I'll give you one marshmallow right. now or yeah. two marshmallows in 10 minutes. And so many small humans cannot handle it. Yeah. Well, actually, so the, the, the thing there, though, of course, is uh, uh, is more uh, the history of the child is is more important than than even age. What it, what, it, what it really comes down to in the one on humans is whether or not they come from a household that is more or less affluent. If right, at a certain out, talking age, about, but earlier, at a certain age, yeah, yeah. When when you use it, when you do it with a two year old, they pretty much always fail. <laughs> but when you <laughs> three, four, five, they they start to develop these other things. But I just more meant that this is a similar kind of delayed gratification experiment, yeah, model. It is. It is that that you are going to get yummy shrimps later yeah. if you don't eat the crab now. Keep your keep your stomach ready to eat all those shrimps and yeah. they did yeah but anyway this is a uh, very you know it's very complex cognitive behavior for an otherwise simple organism like you're saying blair are they that simple i think it really comes down to has this cognitive ability lasted for 550 million years or did it develop convergently and if so why? Yeah. Why do cephalopods have this amazing cognitive ability that other animals do not? Fascinating. And is this, yeah, and if you can answer that question, mm -hmm. is this something that will tell us about the evolution of this behavior in mm -hmm. other species, or is it telling us something about the process of cognition developing over ev evolutionary time, generally? Mm -hmm a semi-social species yeah. and then for fun you can just picture a stuff. cuttlefish going oh i'm too full i can't finish the shrimp <laughs> which also just tickles me <laughs> this too, yeah. the shrimp is too much there's a fun video going around of a uh cuttlefish pretending to be a hermit crab oh really and it's great and it it 
holds its shape and its color tr- looks like a hermit crab until another quote unquote hermit crab comes up and then they both realize that they're not hermit crabs and they both turn into cuttlefish and they like start color matching each other and it's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm watching it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Wow. <laughs> it's a hermit Such crab. No, I'm amazing not. creature. I'm a cuttlefish. That's right. Oh, that's okay, cool. everyone. I think it's time for us to take a quick break. We will be back in just a few moments with more This Week in Science. I've got cats coming up in the second half. Stay tuned. We can explain things you've heard more than intuition. Thank you for listening to Twist. You are the reason we are able to do what we do every week, bringing you up to date and down to earth news and views on science discoveries. And with your help, we can do even more together. We can bring a sane perspective to a world full of misinformation. Head to twist.org right now. Click on the Patreon link and choose your level of support. Be a part of bringing sanity and science to more people. We can't do it without you. And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. Yes, we are back. And this week, hold on, let me get a story. We have a What Has Science Done for Me Lately? But what did I do with it? That is the question. This is what I need to find, and I forgot to put it in the run- rundown. Okay, here it is. I have found it. Here it is. It is time now for that segment that we want to fill with all of your emails and stories. And this week we have a What Has Science Done For Me Lately from a minion, Brody Pomper. Greetings, Twist Humans! I am a greenhouse manager growing grasses, herbaceous, perennials, and bamboo for the wholesale ornamental trade. My undergrad education was in plant science and agroecology, and I've become obsessed with plant pathology. I'm studying bioinformatics at the graduate level while working so that I can once again live in a science world, which is my natural habitat. What science has done for me lately is biocontrols. Natural enemies of arthropod pests, beneficial fungi, and bacteria. I learned about this in my undergraduate work in the Penn State research greenhouses, mainly in the form of Encarcia formosa wasps, Aphidius colomani wasps, and Neocyulus comeric. I can't even say these names. Neocyulus cucumeris mites. There we go. In my current work as a greenhouse manager, I have moved my company away from the heavily chemical-dependent pest management system towards a much less toxic method of keeping our lovely plant babies healthy and beautiful. I get to team up with such beautiful and proud organisms from Aphidius, a parasitoid wasp of aphids, Delosia, a beetle broad-spectrum predator, Stratiolalaps, a mite that eats fungus gnat larvae, Steinermia, a nematode that kills fungus gnat larvae with a bacterial toxin produced from bacteria inside the nematodes. Oh my gosh, death from within. Mm. And that's just the macro mesofaunal creatures. I get to put the strato- stratio lalaps mites out onto the newly potted plants using a leaf blower with a funnel full of mites <laughs> attached to the barrel. Five-year-old me is so proud of 34-year-old me. I feel like a general deploying troops to my citizens. 
I also get to team up with wise, tough, and innumerable, innumerable microbes with beautiful names like Glomus, Trichoderma, Pisolithus, Rhizo, Rhizopogon, Azospirillum, Pseudomonas, Streptomyces, and Painobacillus. Some of these creatures parasitize pathogenic fungi. Others make nutrients more available to the plant. Others still competitively exclude the pathogens. It's dazzling, dazzlingly complex, and there's so many unknowns just the way I like it. The science involved in this nascent revolution of biological plant protection is amazing, and I am humbled to benefit from countless careers worth of careful study. I dream of further biocontrols, such as a nematode that kills slugs. There is one available in Europe that's not allowed in North America because it might just kill all of our native gastropods. <laughs> There is research that into <laughs> yeah, that'd be bad. There is research into finding a good candidate for a North American equivalent. This science has allowed me to go home with less pesticide residue on my skin and in my lungs, and more importantly, less damage to the environment and my coworkers. More broadly, my chosen science has given me purpose and direction in life, and I am told on a near weekly basis by someone that my obvious passion is inspirational. Purposeful living makes me brave, strong, and patient in my daily life. Another thing to pass on to listeners who may be disappointed with their work if they're not using their brain enough for their liking, as was the case for me a while ago, hack a job so that you end up doing what you want to do. I was depressed because I wasn't a capital S scientist doing grad school research because I'm choosing to be a present parent for my teenage daughter until I just made my job into that of a scientist. I'm addicted to data collection and so have started managing vapor pressure deficit by logging temperature and relative humidity. I run experiments, which makes me excited to go to work and get that data. Mm -hmm. So within whatever constraints your pla are placed on you, I encourage you to bend and tweak your work until it gives you something rewarding. I love twists because you guys have fabulous contextualization and incisive critical thinking, which allows me to better deploy the eyebrow of doubt. <laughs> when encountering popular science press, I'm low key trying to break into the science communication world myself, mainly in regards to fungi and plant microbe interactions, phytobiomes, and shows like Twists, In Defense of Plants, Ologies, Twim, Twi Twivo, Journey to the Microcosmos, Crime Pays But Botany Doesn't, The Brain Scoop, and This mm -hmm. Podcast Will Kill You, to name just a few, give me zealous assurance that there is a market and a hunger out there for the kind of wonky stuff that few people in my personal life want to discuss. Gratefully, Brody Burl Pomper, BS, Plant Science. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Brody, thank you so much for writing in with this letter. I really enjoyed it. I, although, yes, the Latin names of the species were a tongue twister at times, but it was a challenge I, I rose to. <laughs> I appreciated it. It reminded me of uh, a revamp, uh, I think from the 80, uh, maybe 90s, of The Outer Limits sci-fi show. And mm. uh, one of the episodes, there's this researcher and, and he's discovered, he's got Martian soil samples and it turns out there's these little eggs in there and he grows them up. And then at some point, the uh, these little scorpion-like creatures uh, become sort of sentient and they're they're evolving before him and, and they make uh he's he's got them in this this large aquarium and they at first they're making these these sort of structures sort of like uh some ants will make these sort of elaborate tall structures that they will live in and then at some point there is an image of him emblazoned on the structure so they, they actually you know i mean you know it might not be there yet but but maybe they do appreciate you on a level that you you're not aware of yet Perhaps, perhaps <laughs> they do. Although I am sure the uh, the pathogens that you're killing off with your biocontrol do not appreciate it. <laughs> ah, it'll just make them stronger. It'll make them stronger. It's good. If you would like to write in with your own tale of science, with your own ideas about what science has done for you lately, send me an email, kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. You can leave us a message on our Facebook page. Also, that's facebook.com slash thisweekinscience. I want to keep filling this little segment of the show with content from you. So write. Okay, Justin, why are you so violent? Ah, did you notice my Cobra Kai shirt that I'm wearing today? Yeah. Uh, strike, strike hard, no mercy. 
Yes, this uh, also takes place in the animal kingdom. Uh, the snake's poisonous venom, uh, the lion's lacerating claws, wolf's terrible teeth, the owl's lethal talons, the cone snail's deadly harpoon. Uh, <laughs> nature develops specialized features that can be used as tools or weapons for hunting prey. But there is another evolution of specialized features uh, and body size that tends to show up, primarily in males. Things like horns, antlers, tusks, and claws of bulls, rams, walrus, elk, and elephant, as well as oodles of crustaceans and beetles have features that are meant to do what, Blair? <laughs> defend, you're right, defend their mating territory. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> These are features that are used as <laughs> weapons for mate competition uh, and defense more than anything else. These are these are evolved weapons uh, and tools that are that have uh, mostly in male populations that are designed around the, the conflict of mate competition. Uh, but what about humans? Do humans have anything like this? Well. According to new research from the University of Utah, males of the human species have upper bodies that are built for punching. Yeah, you know, like the karate contest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, this is published in the Journal Hunting. of Experimental Biology. Uh, in mammals in general, says Utah professor David Carrier, the difference between males and females is often greatest in the structures that are used as weapons. And for years, Caria has been exploring the hypothesis that generations of interpersonal male-male aggression long in our past have shaped structures in human bodies to specialize us for fighting one another specifically. Uh, past work has shown that proportions uh, of the hand aren't just for manual dexterity. They potentially also protect the hand when it is formed into a fist. Other studies have looked at the strength of the bones in the face, which were likely to be target for such punches. Uh, how our heels planted in the ground can confer additional upper body strength. So we've got some sort of leverage uh, that, that lends to this. Uh, one of the predictions that comes out of those, Carrier says, is if we are specialized for punching, you might expect males to be particularly strong in the muscles that are associated with throwing a punch. Now, we already know that human males on average have 75 to 90 percent more strength than females. The question is body. why? Yes. Yeah. Uh, researchers measuring uh, measured punching strength of some pretty sm small sample size, 20 men, 19 women. Uh, but they did make these were all uh, reported as physically active types. So they weren't measuring the punches of couch potatoes. Uh, the researchers rigged up a hand <laughs> crank that would mimic the motion of a punch because they didn't want to injure any of their subjects by actually making them punch things. And they also did a measurement of our arm pulling strength of a lion forward over their head uh, because they wanted to also test uh, an alternative hypothesis that the upper body strength of males may have developed out of the throwing spears or, th or hurtling objects. What about just right. for work in general? Uh, yeah, so it's totally possible. You know, uh, we want it. What's the, what's the one thing that we have seen over and over and over again, uh, through hominin history, uh, even before, well, well before millions of years before the current modern human was uh, with axe tools. These, these stone yeah. axe tools that we would use for, for, for carving things. Absolutely. Uh, and, but again, and not yeah, just the axe, not just axe tools for carving, but we've also seen uh, in not in modern tribal cultures, we see a division of labor very often that the men go do the hunting and the women uh, stay around the camp or the settlement and raise the children and mm -hmm. fix the food. And uh, there seems to be there seems to be a division of labor in terms of the things that would require strength. Is that, and, but then again, is it cause or effect? Mm -hmm. And How that was also, work? 
that's also that's true of current modern humans, uh, but the dominant for uh, the hominin for you know the five hundred thousand years before us that was hunting uh, mm -hmm. was was male and female. Neanderthals right. were a mixed group. Uh, so and and some so and also the, I think a lot of early human hunting, current modern human hunting involved uh this this uh practice i can't remember exactly what the name of it was but it's because we could sweat we could just keep chasing and irritating an animal and running after it until it mm -hmm. passed out from mm -hmm. heat exhaustion and then we had something that couldn't get up very well <laughs> that we could kill i so, got you down and now i will get you yeah so we weren't really we were, it looks like we didn't develop this this strength from throwing things though uh based on mm -hmm. the difference here because what they found was mm -hmm. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between men and women uh, in sort of magnifying their their physical power by throwing things with the overhead pull test. However, during the punch motion, uh, males' average power was 162% greater than females, and the least powerful male in their group was still stronger than the most powerful woman in terms of punching things. So a very distinct uh, thing between the genders uh, but less so when it came to the throwing of things. Um, Carrie, I, have, I, I have one issue with this, though. <clears throat> oh. And that is that punching is actually really bad for your hands. Mm. Yeah, Punching so it was, uh, breaks your fingers if you do it a lot or too hard. Yes. And so that, that was one of the things that they had uh, discovered is that the way that a uh, human hand is designed, there's considerably less damage done to the hand in a fist than uh, then perhaps if it was designed in a different way or if it was a different, if, if you were comparing it maybe to a primate. Okay. Wait, so so it says when, it, when, when they teach you self-defense, for mm -hmm. example, they tell you never, ever to punch with your fist because Who's, you break who fingers. Who tells you this? My kickboxing instructor. Okay, well, they, um, that's because they have a bias towards but, kicking people. No, no, no. Actually, you're supposed to... <laughs> self-defense tip you're supposed to punch with this part of your hand with the the actually the palm of your hand the bone the bony um part of the palm where your thumb connects that is actually what you're supposed to punch with because um yeah you break you can break your fingers when you so, punch. so but there's, that's there's a, this is this tools. is the there are different schools, and I will say that if you have not learned how to form a proper fist, which if you're just taking a self-defense class, you don't yeah. know how to form a proper fist. You don't have the hand strength to form a proper fist, and so you're not going to be supporting the fingers well enough to not break them. But mm. people who are fighters, mm -hmm. they have built up their hand strength and their punching, the, the form of their fist is actually very solid mm. and doesn't easily break. So it's more that split that, you may that split many the skin on your knuckles first, but we're too domesticated is what you, you're telling. <laughs> That's me. what I would say. Okay. I would say there are there are people who are trained to fight and they punch All and right. they do not break their fingers just with a punch. <laughs> but there's um but there's so it's it's how you make the fist and then also uh -huh. there's just upper body strength being able to throw an elbow um with strength is something that would be useful as well. But yes. Mm -hmm. But, but yes. anyway, the, the, the sort of summary here is that it is quite potential. If we look at the human uh, from a purely anthropological, <laughs> we step back and we just look at humans uh, as another animal, as part of it, then, then you can devise, as we do when we look at animals that have really strange horny formations in their faces and they, you know, or big claws that they use to whack each other with when fighting over mates. And we say that these are features that evolved out of mate competition. It's quite possible you could look at the human animal and say that it's the chances are that for maybe millions of years, uh, males have been punching each other in the face over women. I do like this. The one thing that this brings back is we've talked about the other side of this story, which is the study of the human jaw. And it, the original question was whether or not the jaw, male jaw specifically, had evolved to take a punch. Mm. And mm. I, I think that was one of the first questions. And so I find it interesting that now they're starting to look at the other side of it, which is <laughs> the actual throwing the punch. <laughs> yeah, What's and you know, there's, there's, uh, there is an there's a great history of watching people 
punch each other in the face, basically, uh, <laughs> from boxing to MMA. It's not yes. something I've ever been really particularly uh, drawn to, but it is a phenomenal, it gathers a phenomenal amount of attention from people wanting to see two men walk into a ring and punch each other in the face over and over again. And it, and it may harken back to a long ancestry of having done this for mate competition. So maybe part of the excitement of watching somebody punch somebody else in the face until they fall down is that you're, part of your brain is going, ooh, they get the mate. Oh, well done. Well, way to survive. Way to, way to complete your, your biological task. Uh, it, it may be just that simple. It might not have anything to do with regular violence as we may perceive it. Yeah. Yep. Might not be regular. Sp could be more sporadic. Yeah. yeah. Or perhaps all violence stems from that. I I don't I don't know. I, I think that would be a far. I think there's a difference between uh well uh, make like competition. Time to look and at then, the brains is all I have violence. to say about that. Look at the brains. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend uh, you know, it. I'm not saying that we should all be <laughs> going and punching each other in the face. Please don't don't get me wrong. I don't think people should have this as part of a meeting room. Although, <laughs> you know, really, like, do you take so and so to be your wife? Yeah, you, I do, I do. And then they both turn around and punch the priest. I think that would be kind of like you know, hearkening back to the old the old ways. But no, I, I think being civilized is probably a better way. To do it. It's a it's a better way. It's a better yeah. way being civilized. But you know. Something that happens often is that we make assumptions about the way things work. Yes. And then we actually go to look at it and the science, the research, because we're trying, we're looking at it in a way that just our eyes wouldn't normally perceive, our brains wouldn't normally perceive. It allows us to see that, oh, wow, our assumptions are totally wrong and things don't work that way. This is what happened in a study published in Science Advances this week, researchers from the University of California, Davis. Go, Davis. Davis. Yeah, we're studying bumblebees. Mm. They were looking at bumblebees, those oxen of the bee world carrying their nectar mm. loads around. And they said, oh, look at these, these bumblebees. They can carry lots of nectar. And hey, if you are a bee and you've got more nectar, it would make sense that the more nectar you have, the harder you're going to beat your wings and pump your wings to be able to carry that load. And they assumed that the beating of the, the bee wings would become less efficient over time. And so these researchers, Susan Gagliardi in the College of Biological Sciences and Professor uh, Stacy Combs from the Department of Neurobiology, Physiology, and Behavior, they uh, emptied out they emptied out snow globes so that they could put bees in them and measure <laughs> the effort <laughs> that the bees went through to fly with a variety of loads. They soldered small pieces of wire to the bees to be able to change the weight of the bee, and then took video of them flying around and they found that these bees as they were flying that they did change their wing beat pattern they did uh, start beating their wings more strongly and the the bee wing beat also has a little uh, kind of figure eight dipping action mm -hmm. in it. The, the wings kind of scoop forward and scoop back. And so the bee is working to lift air underneath. And I think Blair's talked about the dynamics of, of insect flight uh, previously. But instead of becoming less efficient with more weight, they became more efficient. Mm -hmm. But they haven't been able to discover what the bees are doing because... All they're seeing the bees do so far is beat their wings at a higher frequency and uh, maybe a little harder, but mm -hmm. they don't understand how the efficiency of carrying heavier, we heavier weights is increasing. They ha it's a mystery. Hmm. Well, you know what, what that so, reminds me of is that humans, when we jog, we bop up and down, right? And we actually waste oh, yeah. a lot of energy. It's very inefficient. But when we run, there's a lot less energy lost with up and down motion. It's a lot more smooth. 
And so it, it kind of sounds almost like that to me. The fact that they're working harder and faster allows for less vertical movement and less vertical energy lost, potentially, the way that they're moving the wings. And, and what I could also That's say really is That's really interesting that, is insight, that, Blair. Yeah. Yeah. And with, with that, with following that logic, then uh, running uh, would be a thing that, that running is for, <laughs> right? As opposed mm -hmm. to jogging. Which isn't really the thing that it's no. for. It's an in between, but it's maybe not what we've developed as a as a skill set in chasing down things across uh, the ages. Um, yeah, so maybe the, the take a yog. The normal uh, uh, the normal uh, design for a, a bee is to be carrying something, and so then maybe that's their more efficient place. With that, that a lot of that flight is geared around being able to being able to do uh, but yeah a hypothesis mm -hmm. hypotheses uh, are tough you got to walk in with one you got to <laughs> identify what you're going for but you can't prove anything with one you can just disprove stuff so they're a hypothesis they can disprove yeah. it but it doesn't actually prove anything even if they get the result that matches it they, they still right. <laughs> yeah they still have all their work ahead of other things other things to get rid of but the one thing they have been able to take away from this is that they know that if we are going to run that analogy of jogging versus running, that the bees are making a choice to jog or run when they're carrying different sized loads. And the bees can switch between these modes at will. It, and, you, and they say that, that they one day the same bee on a, on a different day is going to pick a new way to flap its wings. Hmm. That that the bees are actually not completely consistent in the way they do this, but they have this efficient mode, um, and maybe it is like jogging or running. And one day you jog with the heavy load because oh my god, hmm. and then another day you're feeling more peppy because you slept really well, and you're like, I'm running. Look at me run. Ha -ha, I carry it. Anyway. Hmm. Could yeah, be. I, would think, I would think they would always go faster when they had the heavy thing because they're like, I just want to drop this off. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me get there. Get it over with. Yeah, yeah. But they it, they have a dynamic choice. This this is bees choosing whether to jog or to run. Hmm. And we I don't know, know how they choosing. change that manner. Yeah. I don't know if it's choosing. I sir, I, the way I kind of pictured it would be like a uh, I somehow pictured it like a, a vehicle that's designed to carry. Wait, like a big rig truck that's designed mm -hmm. to carry like a heavy load. And if that vehicle is going down the road with no load, it's not as efficient. It may be harder to steer. It may be, yeah. But once it's got the load that it was designed to, to really operate at full speed, it's completely solid on the road. So it could be that, you know, part of this optimization of the design with the with the additional weight is so that the, the B, once it finds... Uh, something to bring back to the hive worth bringing back mm -hmm. is is really good at it. And the rest of the time it can fly like a bumblebee because who cares? There's nothing important going on yet. Yeah, it's got a it's got a an overdrive setting or yeah. whatever you yeah. can go into. <laughs> go into hyper pump the nitrous. <laughs> got a hall mode with a longer first gear. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. There was another bee story this week, which a couple of people did send me, uh, published in Science this last week. There are researchers who are not on the physiology side of the bees with how they fly, but they are engineering bees' microbiomes to produce a chemical that causes mites and the virus that causes varroa mites and the virus that causes colony collapse disorder to self-destruct. Mm. Yeah. So Cornell, Cornell University um, uh, toxicologist Jeffrey Scott uh, said that it's kind of like a customized medicine for honeybees. So they, um, they've picked a bacterial species, Snodgrassella alvi, and put it to work with some extra genetic code. Um, and they have been able this they're, they're using rna interference to produce these molecules this that disrupt uh communication within the cells and then lead to this self-destruction 
of uh, of the viruses and the mites themselves. And this is good potentially for colony collapse disorder. Probiotics it's, for bees. It is kind of, but yeah, it's an interesting probiotic because it's genetically engineered and it's directly targeting these uh, the the cause of colony collapse disorder. But this is very, very, very far away from actually being applied to commercial hives. They've only looked at groups of 20 bees of similar ages for only a couple of weeks. And so they're not even getting close to what a normal hive would, uh, how big a normal hive would be. Um, but, you know, anything uh, positive to help us save the bees. It yes. would be amazing. They're important. Very important. Mm -hmm. Justin, would ah, you like to tell us another story? I've got a coronavirus update. Uh, this is the time of this episode. Uh, or at least it was written. Uh, there were 28,000... We need a sound drop for this one. A sound drop? <laughs> yeah, like a like a theme, like a <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay, I got it. update. <laughs> this just in, this just in. Hi. At the time of the <laughs> at the time of this episode, there are twenty eight thousand seventy eight confirmed cases of the coronavirus. Uh, the specifically the what is it the COVID uh, NCOV NCOV yeah 2019 NCOV N stands for novel mm. and COV stands for coronavirus 2019 but are, NCOV but they're going to rename it yeah, I think it could, at some point they really should I think they're they, waiting they to find some, out what it comes from right they're they're when well, they find out what it comes from but there's also uh, an effort in play right now and we could be getting a name a new name. Within days. Ooh. Ooh. So. SARS 2, the sequel? No. <laughs> wildlife market virus. Sorry, is that, is that insensitive? <laughs> Maybe. I think the wildlife market virus should be. Okay. Yeah. Give us your update, Justin. So, yeah. 28,078 confirmed cases with 564 reported deaths. Uh, and despite this rapid rise in the cases, the mortality rate remains at about 2% overall. Uh, though it is much lower outside of China. Additionally, the pneumonia deaths associated with the virus are occurring among older individuals at rates similar to seasonal flu, which either makes it not such a big deal or makes the regular seasonal flu a major health crisis, depending on your age. While China remi remains the most affected nation, cases have been found in just about every developed nation. I think 26 plus countries uh, now have cases uh, identified. The sort of uh, major concern there, though, is the lack of cases in anywhere in Africa, anywhere in South America, and only two cases in Russia, which sounds like uh, underreporting or missed cases. Uh, concerning also because it means that if there are cases in these regions that are going unreported, uh, Despite the efforts that take place elsewhere to create quarantine, you may be creating human reservoirs. Uh, mm -hmm. if you, it's hard to believe that nowhere in Africa or South America is there a single case of this. Right. Yeah. And it's hard to believe, like you said, that there's only two in Russia. Yeah. All of Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, although I, my, my instinct would tell me that Russia is doing its own monitoring, but not yeah. uh, cooperating with reporting, reporting whereas... Yeah. Other places just may not have had the infrastructure to react quickly enough to differentiate this from a regular flu. Yeah, that is the absolute, uh, the truth. And most likely in Africa, that's what we're dealing with is they don't have tests to be able to differentiate it. Okay, so uh, so interestingly, though, this last week, we've had the, the seriousness both being uh, taken very serious. Uh, the outbreak being taken very serious and being played down considerably in China, which is suffering financial losses while struggling to contain the outbreak. Apparently 62 airlines have canceled services and flights to China at this point. Mm -hmm. This week found China's foreign ministry spokeswoman pointing fingers at the United States and other countries for overreacting uh, to the uh, stating that the U.S. had inappropriately overreacted by uh, issuing negative travel advisory statements and stating the United States hasn't provided assistance uh, despite 
being the first to impose a travel ban on Chinese travelers, and that this was this was only to create and spread fear. Meanwhile, 11 million people within the Chinese city of Wuhan remained locked down on quarantine for a yep. second week mm -hmm. without uh, significant services being provided to them. While the fire, foreign ministry spokeswoman regularly gives in-person public statements and responds probably to pre-written questions from the not-so-free press, uh, the current information releases have all been done by streaming video. So no more, no more going out in person mm -hmm. and in public uh, and, and delivering these messages. And I can see, yeah, the numbers actually got a little bit higher since, uh, as we're now showing, 28,280 confirmed cases, 565 deaths. What's also interesting is the total number of uh, patients that have recovered uh, was about similar a week ago to the number of deaths and is now doubling the number of deaths. So our, we're, uh, you know, the expectation is if these trends continue, we're still looking at something that is as lethal and is recoverable uh, as a regular seasonal flu. However, that's it still is not hundreds of thousands of people around the mm -hmm. world. Yeah. Well, and, and actually, yeah. this is this is a tiny, tiny number compared to what happens in a regular seasonal flu, where 35 million people in the United States alone get it, and you know, many tens of thousands die from it. And it affects the tends to affect elderly uh, people. Well, who but may we have, have a flu shot people. that yes. sometimes can be effective against that, and we do not currently have a coronavirus. Vaccine. No, don't have a vaccine, so... and, but what's also interesting is, is is that we are dealing with something that we know has crossed at least one, if not two, species uh, in its in its mutations and its ability to cross infect animals. So, what we what we don't know is what else can this jump to? For instance, if it can jump from human to human, if it's come from a different mammal into humans, can it go to your cat? Can it go to your dog? Can it also find another reservoir post-human? And can it mutate within humans to become more or less deadly? So right. the fact that we have very little information in that category makes this pandemic worth uh, not panicking, but being very, very serious about. And again, even if it we turns know out, little about it. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it turns out to never never become more lethal and the family pets are safe from this and everything else, it's a good test run. We should be mm -hmm. practicing at containment in case this was a more lethal or uh, a strain of a, a virus that was causing more damage. Yeah. So. And, and, and to it's your the point, kind of thing. Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, Blair. Well, the the graph on the screen here in the lower right is actually, I think, exactly what you want to see in a situation like this. It, it's very frustrating that there's exponential growth within China, but that uh, the growth of number of cases outside of mainland China is pretty much a flat line. There are not a lot of new cases popping up around the globe. Some of that might have to do with reporting, true, but if we are able to better contain this, it won't blow to the worldwide proportions that SARS did in the past. And I think that that's that this is a good kind of show of how things have adjusted since then. So it's already well past SARS. Uh, it, it's it's well, well past that number in terms of pe people uh, who have it. Now, the deaths yeah. are still lower because it's not as lethal, which also I thought it, <clears throat> I thought it had not spread as evenly across, though, that it was more localized. Oh, that's, in terms that's of, totally you possible. Can see that. Yeah, that's yeah. totally possible. It's also very possible that the 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 current spike in numbers uh, it may continue partly within China, partly because there is a lot of talk about when it was uh, initially reported as having been discovered may not have been actually the time point at which it was actually discovered, and it may have been going on a little bit, if not a lot longer, yeah. uh, which also would help to explain why it has reached such a large population, if not much larger than what we're seeing reported uh, within China. So, And even the, outside of China, even though we, like you mentioned earlier, even though countries are reporting it, there is still a limitation in health services ability to diagnose this particular virus versus the flu 
or mm -hmm. versus other symptoms that seem that, that are very similar. And so the diagnostic ability and then putting it on the tally uh, is is difficult. Um, however, yeah. it is that's the way it's working. The thing that I find very interesting about this is it's also very visibly beginning to affect uh, not just China economically, but the, uh, the glo global supply where Airbus has shut down a plant in China because mm. of the virus. We have car parts that are not being manufactured because of the quarantine and the shutdown. And so uh, car companies like Toyota and others are potentially going to be unable to fulfill, uh, fulfill orders of their vehicles as a result of the slowdown in the parts. Um, we also, in terms of medical uh medical materials themselves are going to see a slowdown. The majority of surgical masks and other items are produced in China. And so they're staying there to help the population there, number one, but they're also not being manufactured at the rate that they potentially were before because people are sick and things are shutting down. So there is yeah, a, uh, there is a change in availability of things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying in terms of the global scale, it's just a real reminder that, yes, a country may be hit. And I don't know, this is something, this is a political uh, thing, but, you know, we all need to pitch in. Every country needs to pitch in when something like this happens and it affects a country. Yeah. And there's a little bit of a vicious cycle people. here, too, in that. This is exactly why uh, a nation like China with a state run media and everything else might want to suppress the information from coming out because they've seen before how they can be negatively impacted financially. Yeah. Cannot, yep. yeah. And so yeah. Eh, it, it becomes, uh, it becomes part of the problem yeah. that we are so interconnected as well. Yep. Well, it is ongoing. And I mean, I think at this point it, yeah, it. I mean, it. It look. It. It's like you said. It's something that we don't necessarily need to panic about, but it's something to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. And you know, researchers are working to figure out more about it, and they are looking at the spike proteins to determine whether there is uh, something that is already on our hospital shelves that can be used as a treatment to determine uh, what it actually targets in the cells to gain entry. Uh, at this point, it looks as though it may target the say, same key protein as SARS. Um, and if it did, there may be uh, maybe treatments that were developed for SARS that can be used against this particular virus. So there's there's a lot of avenues to go down, mm -hmm. and but there's still a lot to be learned. And, and and the one the one lesson that you can take away from this too, to uh, if you are over the age of sixty years old, is uh, treat this like the regular seasonal flu, as if you had not been vaccinated. Avoid young people. Avoid middle aged people. Avoid people. Be avoid a public germaphobe. <laughs> Become yeah. a public yeah. germaphobe. Yeah, because it's it's you that this is after. Mm -hmm. uh, Wash your hands and uh, yeah, avoid people. <laughs> Don't go yeah. for a power walk through the, the international airport. You'll be fine. Oh, wait, like, wait, what are we doing next week? Mm. <laughs> I power know. Walk in. I did, in fact, see yeah. on that map there is one confirmed case in Seattle. But oh, it was the first. It was the yeah. first, wasn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. In the United States. Yeah. In the U.S. Yes. Oh, speaking of things that make you feel funny, allergies, those itchy eyes, the runny nose. Sometimes it gets more serious. It can affect your breathing. Uh, some people end up in the hospital as a result of allergies. But there's a study that came out this last week that has my brain spinning as to the idea of whether or not some animals have hijacked allergies and the allergic response of their predators hmm. to use it as a defense. Interesting. Very Trying to get their predators sneezing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Itching, no, way. no matter how well they can hide, <laughs> right? No matter how well camouflaged no they are. If I could just stop ah, sneezing. There you, you are. <laughs> there you are, my friend. 
Researchers at the University of Queensland have published on their work looking at a protein from the venom of the slow lorries. Mm. Yes. They compared it to a protein called FELD1, which is a protein in cat dander. And these two molecules have a lot of surprising structural and potentially functional similarities, even though they evolved so far apart. And going through the chemistry, the structural molecular makeup of these proteins from an evolutionary perspective, the researchers say, despite these slow lorries, Despite being a mystery to science, they're commonly smuggled from the wild and sold in the pep trade. So our rescue center research was a perfect opportunity to do some good in a bad situation. And generally, slow lorries use their venom to fight with other slow lorries, causing very slow to heal wounds. But when humans are, vict are bitten, the victims display symptoms as if they're going into allergic shock. And they studied this in the lab, comparing it to the allergic protein in cats and they're, they said this is amazing. Their theory is that since this protein is being used as a defensive weapon in slow lorries, it makes sense that cats may be using the allergen as a defensive weapon as well. The fact that so many people are allergic to cats might not be a coincidence. Hmm. Hmm. This may have been an evolutionarily selected for trait in the wild as a defense against predators. And this ability to trigger allergy as a weapon might not be something restricted to slow lorries, but to have separately evolved. And these proteins, uh, they're, looking, they're looking to test this hypothesis and these proteins more in the future. But in the meantime, what they are looking at is for uh, zookeepers and animal handlers who um, zookeepers and animal handlers who are who are potentially bitten by slow lorries mm. and the venom affects the slow lorries that they could potentially use cat allergy medications what? to help <laughs> stop their allergic response to the the venom Crazy. that be that the venom might actually be treatable with um, allergy medication. So a lot of the of, of these guys that are rescued and put in zoos actually have been um, have had their uh, some of their teeth removed so that they cannot bite. So that's one of the really sad things about this the pet trade for these guys is that um, that's one of the steps. So when rescue individuals end up in zoos, sometimes they don't even have the ability to bite and inject venom anymore, mm. which is pretty interesting. Uh, I have not seen many zoos with lorises in them. So no, no. Well, we they may, are. We may be also like I'm trying to picture like the the, the idea that humans as a predator were. Uh, we're targeted with this. Uh, wouldn't it be the other way around? Wouldn't humans become allergic to cats as sort of like a pre-warning to avoid certain to areas? To avoid them, maybe. Well, then I mean, that wouldn't yeah, be an wouldn't... allergy, would it? It would be well, a reaction, which is like... Yeah, but we... The, the whole allergy thing is that you're the histamines are, are kind of overreacting, right? So... Okay, but think of this. Think of this now. Go go way back in the back of the back machine. Yeah. And And it's just there or it's not selectively. Now, those who are not allergic to cats don't even notice that this cave has a certain <laughs> affect. And they think, ah, <laughs> this looks like a perfectly reasonable place to sleep tonight. And other others with the who, who get this immune response, negative thing, sure. But they're like, oh, I, I'm, I can't breathe. Like this cave, there's something wrong. It's haunted. I don't <laughs> care. I'm out. But they don't get eaten by the lion. So then it persists for more and more generations. Yes. <laughs> That's interesting. I see you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now they are our little our little allergen bearing beasts. Yeah, they're still the enemy, but whatever. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it is very interesting. But you know, if there's a way, if these animals, like you said, if there's a way to counteract the allergenic potential of the slow lorry's venom, then you know, maybe fewer slow lorries will end up 
losing their teeth. Maybe more mm -hmm. will be allowed to keep their teeth. Maybe there will be a way to uh, stop that practice in the future. Yeah. And just in general, yeah. don't get an animal as a pet that's not a pet. <laughs> Right, a lot of them come straight out fair. of the wild. They are not born in captivity. And then all sorts of crazy stuff happens to them as a result because they don't make a good pet. They don't make a good pet. But the I think the take-home message here, though, also is that very interesting question. Is there a possibility that allergies have been hijacked mm -hmm. as a defensive mechanism? But then I can't help but wonder, like, why, I mean, we could talk about this forever, but why do they still exist in cats if cats have domesticated us, which is the new theory, right? Is that, like, we didn't right. domesticate cats, cats domesticated us into taking care of them. Why wouldn't evolutionarily they want to lose the dander? The dander. Yeah, to become Perhaps they more. will. Mm. It's only been... 30, 50, yeah. 80,000 years. But there we don't is, know yet. So. No, and there is the I aspect. I don't think it's been that long. That hasn't been that long. No. With humans, no, it's been several thousand years. I, I would put four or five, yeah. yeah. 5,000 years tops, I would right. say, with cats. Maybe it's not a really tops. handy creature anyway. to have around. <laughs> <laughs> it really is because it offers no sure benefit. It is. It's not a working animal. Purring, cuddling, soft laughs. Farm cat. Nice. Oh, no, none of those things. <laughs> We've adapted to become familiar with it. Those are horrible <laughs> sounds. Terrible. This is the sounds um, of a predator about to eat you normally. But the other side of it is we know that desensit desensitization to the allergens can work. So individuals who have cats and have a cat allergy can become desensitized to their own cat's dander while still remaining mm -hmm. allergic to a mm -hmm. strange cat's dander. Mm -hmm. So desensitization oh. can be part of... Uh, the picture, so mm -hmm. you have a certain cat that hangs out with you all the time, comes to your farm, you know, maybe lets you touch it, hangs out, sleeps on a blanket, you know, you eat enough of its fur that you're fine with it hanging out a bit and your nose doesn't sniffle as much as it does, as it does for other animals. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. cat allergies, are, aren't cat allergies, it's not just a sniffle though, it's like the tongue swells up. It like depends like on the levels. severity and yeah. the person. It's it like, depends. Yeah, yeah. It depends. Just like with any other allergy. I just get very irritated around cats. Is that, <laughs> is that an allergy? That is not an allergy. This, this is, is a I known... think they're psychotic. This is... I just think they're psychotic. And they freak me out. Like, there's a psychopathic killer in the room with me right now. And nobody seems freaked out by this but me. Yep, that's just you, Justin. <laughs> This is This Week in Science, and if you want to help Twist to grow, get a friend to subscribe today. That would be awesome. Are you ready for some quick science stories? Yeah. Quick science, quick science. How about some people yarn? What? Let me tell you I a yarn. Up. Okay, this one is a little wild. Researchers looking at the extracellular matrix of cells. So this is like collagen. It's the fibers and proteins in between the cells. The thing that kind of holds the basement membrane of your cells together for your skin. Extracellular matrix, very important for supporting your cells. The these researchers, they were able to grow extracellular matrix into these sheets. And I was like, oh, look, we've got extracellular matrix sheets. Hmm. That's great. But what are we going to do with them? So they cut them up into little strips and used textile manufacturing techniques to uh, treat them like yarn and basically make people thread. And this people thread can be used to close sutures, to put graft into wounds that require a little scaffolding and support to help the cells along the way and that can be tied in lots of pretty knots but it won't be rejected by your body because it's people yarn you know the first thing i thought of when you picked up this picture is a uh, vaginal mesh which is something that there's all sorts of uh medical issues with oh you could make you could make Cellular vaginal mesh. That's fascinating. 
That was so not her. the first thing I thought of. But <laughs> sorry, I don't know why. Is that, the way. Is that sweater you're wearing? Is that alpaca? Alpaca? No, yeah. it's vaginal mesh. It's vaginal mesh. <laughs> so I, I think it's because I, I, I used to watch like game shows during the middle of the day when I worked during weekends. So I would get weekdays off, and and they would always have the like, "Did you have a vaginal mesh surgery that went wrong?" Kind of commercials oh, a know. lot because oh, there's right. a lot of complications with those surgeries. Maybe this could solve those problems. There you go. But yeah, I mean, instead of thread, instead of staples, and uh, you know, we've got we've got these plastics and we've got these polymers. But now we have stuff made textiles made mm -hmm. out of people. Well, the stuff between the cells of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, human textiles. I think this is one of the. This is super cool. And then uh, my. Last story is updating everyone on the question of whether or not red meat is bad for you. A new paper has been published in the JAMA uh, Journal of the the JAMA Internal Medicine Journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association, looking at a cohort of 2,682 U.S. adults from six prospective cohort studies. That means this is a meta-analysis meta looking at the intake of meat, unprocessed red meat, poultry, and fish, and comparing it with incident cardiovascular disease or all-death mortality. And dun-dun-dun, if you eat red meat... You're more likely to have a heart attack and die. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. pretty much. Although yeah. technically, is it the red meat or is it the, the it's fat? It's linked. It might be the fat. Who knows? The but lipids. They did find that um, every meat except for fish, so red meat, unprocessed red meat, and poultry, all Huh. were associated with higher incident of cardiovascular Poultry. disease. Poultry, too, which was surprising. Ah, you fried chicken. Yeah, you Could eat be a the fried, fried chicken. That's probably, yeah. And fish was the only one not associated. However, all-cause mortality, chicken and fish were lumped together, and red meat was uh, was on the bad side. So the researchers pretty much say if you're going to... Um, eat meat you're taking your life in your hands no that's not what they say but <laughs> meat <laughs> consumption um is uh, is definitely something that um the actually one of the researchers says that eating meat at any level is not really safe two red meat or poultry servings a week were linked to premature death and heart disease so fish it is i, I have a story that a quick story that i didn't bring uh, okay. They found evidence of <clears throat> Neanderthal DNA in African populations. Uh, but it's exciting, but then it also t it turns out that they think it came from uh, European backwash. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, uh, current modern humans who left Africa, uh, settled in the Middle East and Europe, uh, interbred with uh, Neanderthals, and then at some point later, some of those descendants came back uh migrated back to africa and that's why the the signal is there so not ancient neanderthals of africa and that's why i didn't bring the story but it's it's quick <laughs> it's, it's not so it's not it's a it's a Euro, eurasian still really backwash mm -hmm. still really go. interesting but yeah very, um very real quick you want to hear about spider glue yes yeah. oh yeah we oh, never yeah. got to the spider oh, glue yeah. story yeah so glue, uh glue Moth wings, one of the great things about moth wings is since they're fuzzy and they're covered in tiny scales that sloth off as, as you touch them, it's really easy for them to escape spider webs. But there's a type of orb weaver spider called the Sirtarachne akirai. Say that again? <laughs> that, nope. That lives in rice paddies <laughs> in Japan. And they actually make their webs horizontally and have these silks that dangle down and they're drenched in a special glue that forms globules that look like beads on a string. You can see them with the naked eye. Sounds beautiful. Um, the, they have a special glue on them that only works in humid conditions. 
And it allows for the glue droplets to actually um, go through the capillaries and underneath these little scales of the moth wings and actually mm -hmm. dissolve and solidify all of the these scales and other matter on the wings to kind of make an extra thick, sturdy glue. So they use this defense, defense mechanism against the moths. Wait, it's using a chemical reaction within the, the moth's wing itself? Yes. Oh, that's so it, some it next moves, level yeah. uh, stuff right there. So it moves through the capillaries and also interacts with the water in the scales to kind of liquefy them and re-solidify. And so it's just a fascinating way of getting around this defense mechanism, but it also is a water dependent glue, kind of like super glue actually. Mm -hmm. It that has an amazing opportunity for uh, application for human use. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's follow the glue. Yes. It'll stick. Let's follow the glue. Globules. That's one of those Globules. great words. Nice word. Also, sloth, sloth, off. sloth, sloughing, 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 sloth, sloth, soggy Globules. sloughing, Globules. soggy sloughing globules. You kinda, you it, globule kind of sticks you in an oozy way Globules. too. When you try to say it. globule. <laughs> 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 We've done it. We've done oh, it. Oh, yeah. We came to another end of another episode. Wow. Globule. We've done it. <laughs> Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, share it with a friend. I would love to shout out to wait, wait, Fada. My little what? second half bit. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'd love to say thank you to Fada for your help with social media and show notes. Gord for manning the chat room. Thank you so much. ID4, who's not here tonight, but for usually recording the shows, we've got audio. And I want to thank our Patreon sponsors and the Burroughs Welcome Fund for their generous support. Thank you to yeah. Paul Disney, Stu Pollock, Ed Dyer, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Ed, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Bob Calder, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Ben Bignell, Justin Taylor, P.S., Josiah Zaner, Howard Tan, Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan K., Matt Bass, Darren Hannon, Pac Patrick Pecoraro, Gene Tellier, John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney Lewis, Tiffany Boyd, Mountain Sloth, Seth Gradney, Stephen Alberon, Rat John Arsnami, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, R.T. Rick Ramos, Paul John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lucy Slazuski, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflow, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, EO. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. I'm a seal clapping. I can make your hands clap. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash this week in science on next week's show. Remember there will be no live Wednesday broadcast, what? but tune in to twist.org slash live on Friday, the 14th at 1230 PM. And it's Saturday, the 15th at 1130 AM for our live shows at the AAAS annual meeting in Seattle, Washington. Yes, these uh, shows will also be published as podcast episodes. Just Google This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. And if you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and the links to the stories we talked about will be available on our website. You can go there, www.twist.org. You can look up how to spell globule and globule. look at videos of seals clapping. When you're there, you can also sign up for our newsletter, which we'll definitely be sending one out after AAAS to tell you about our experience at the conference. Nice. And if you want to contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistmeaning at gmail.com, or Blair at Blair Baz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, which is T W I S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, your email will be 
Spam filtered into oblivion. <laughs> you can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week on Friday and Saturday. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. is coming your way so everybody listen to what i say i use the scientific method for all that it's worth and i'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science science science, science. science. this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, science. i've got one to and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of Toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science Science! This week in science Science! This week in science Science! 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science! 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 science. Laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. We did it. We we did it. Did another episode of this week in science. Sadie, you only messed me up once tonight. <laughs> Noodles wants to know what beanie is that? It keeps all your hair in. Well, first, I have my hair in a braid. Second, I think I'm going bald. No. And no, I'm not going bald. <laughs> take a shower yeah it's a big it's a oh my God. it is a it's this very large Sadie's going bald sometimes i wear it and i think maybe oh my I, God. I could be like the pope here this is good like yeah either that or i could be like it's very cone headish sticks up 
<laughs> I can put my bun inside of it and then it sticks up in the back and I look very cone heady. <laughs> Very good. Have I love this beanie. It's my, I will be very sad the day I decide this beanie is too old to wear anymore. So oh. sad. Nah, man. If Nah. it gets too old, it's just vintage. <laughs> it's just my vintage beanie. That's all. Right, it's a slouchy beanie. What did what did she do? What is your doc doing? What did happen? She ran up onto the couch and then like banked off of it to jump off <laughs> towards the toy I was holding. I hear her growling. She's like, you have ignored me for so long. So many hours of ignoring. I can't take it anymore. I'm going to go bite your couch. Oh my God. I'm so so bad. upset. <sighs> My little angel is no angel, <laughs> it oh turns no out. she's hiding her She was beam chewing inside on my furniture. bad Sadie <laughs> bad Sadie I'm suddenly, I feel like I have so much more compassion for the fact that my dad didn't want, I, I love having a puppy. It's very fun, but I totally understand why my dad was like, no, No one-year-old way. dogs only. Yep. Already potty trained, already threw all, a lot of the bad behavior. They don't bite the things. That's right. They don't chew on furniture so much. Yeah, anyway. It's very funny. I do I do feel like I have to be like, Dad, I'm sorry I gave you so much grief You had no idea about wanting what you a puppy. were in for. I totally get it. I totally get it. Puppies are like little children. They're little, Little they're worse babies. than, they're worse than little babies. No, she... Did I tell you, like, a couple weeks ago, she just peed on the, on our bed, which she doesn't even sleep on our bed. She just, like, hangs And <laughs> you out peed there sometimes in her. while we're cleaning or, like, getting ready for the day. And she had just gone to the bathroom, too. And she just, like, walked over a couple feet on the bed and just, Peed. just peed. Just took a big pee. Thanks, Sadie. And at first Thanks. I was mad, and then I was like, no, nah, she's a baby. Like, she just, sometimes, sometimes she's just got to go. <laughs> it's Oh. It's it's all true. of a sudden. It's She didn't, true. It's she all didn't of a want sudden, to but go. you also have to tell her that is not okay. Do not do that again. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like Yeah, when you have definitely. a baby who you're diaper training And all of a sudden they have to go to the bathroom and then you're the parent running them through the house, holding them while they're peeing, Oh, jeez. going, no, 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 no. Yeah. And the pee is spraying down the hallway. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Parenting. <laughs> Justin, did you ever have the experience with your babies where you're diaper training them? Or they're just not with a diaper and then they have to go to the bathroom and you're like picking them up and running with them to try and get them to the potty. But then they start pottying while you're running. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I no. don't, re I don't Okay. recall. I've had, I've Just had diaper me? malfunctions. <laughs> I've had diaper just malfunctions me? that have, uh, you know, everything is properly in place and you think you're fine. Uh, one time at, uh, at a, at a sushi restaurant here in town, in fact, uh, there was a rumbling and I was in the center of a table. I couldn't get up. So I handed off. And after I handed my child off, I realized that the diaper had failed to contain Everything. the event. Oh, Uh, no. that was rough. Yeah, Gross. lost a pretty decent shirt. <laughs> Did you just eat <laughs> sushi topless? That's no, what no, I'm picturing I, now. I, I had You're an like, undershirt. screw it. Thankfully, I was uh, I was civilized enough to be wearing an undershirt. But I did I did go out to a very nice restaurant in a, in a t shirt. For the rest of the, <laughs> yeah. the rest of the evening. Oh my gosh, singing saw guy in the in the YouTube chat says fun show, although I may have nightmares about bees soldering tire rims on me to see if I can still run away. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. yeah. Yeah. It does make you think for a minute. You're like, oh yeah, I just soldered wire onto a bee. Uh yeah. Let's turn that around Mm -hmm. A bit a of little payback. bit.
Payback. Pay, payback. Let's turn that around. Mm. Oh, my goodness. You're only an apex species once. <laughs> it's true. Just, you get one shot. Let's just, let's just keep it here, being apex. I like it. Let's stay here. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. Um, okay, Justin, you have flights. Yep. For yep. next Everything week. Everything is under control. Everything okay. is under control. Everything's under control. That's good. What do I have to bring? Need... I'm bringing need... my laptop. Yes. <sighs> um. Do I need to bring anything else? Oh, I love sushi gourd. I can't avoid sushi. I love sushi. I, love too. sushi. I just I made sushi. plans to have sushi tomorrow night. Earlier uh, today. My son has been asking for sushi, and I've been not taking him. I think tomorrow is a sushi night. Eat the fish while it is still there. Um, you, yes, bring your laptop. Um, so, yeah, they're going to have, um, I'm going to have to bring, I think, an extra microphone or what, two. What kind do you need? The you need? traditional with the the, what is it, the five pin or whatever? Yes. I have three one. Pin. Three, three pin. Three pin. Do you want one? Do you want me to bring one? What do you have? What do you mean? I have it from my um, pub quizzing days. Oh. I have like a legit go? microphone. You have a legit microphone? Yeah. Okay. With the, with the three pin or whatever it is. I have that and a cord. Okay. Yeah. Bring one. Um, okay. Because I have another. Uh, I don't want to bring. I don't. I'm not going to bring my precious. I can't bring my precious. Hi, Cappy. Did you hear me talking about kitty cats? Hmm. Did you hear me talking about kitty it's cats? It's Twist Pet Corner over here. It is. Hi, Cappy. Meow. Justin, you got any spiders to, to bring to the screen? <laughs> Are those Justin's pets? <laughs> there was a... There <laughs> there was a, a big big I, I know, I'm picturing because aren't you in a hotel room? I'm just like, what could he have? Literally, oh, it's funny you there. said that because I was I was sitting on the bed uh, before I had uh, even rustled the blankets uh, in this place and a spider came walking across uh, right like, towards me. Hey, Ruby. Uh, yeah, I'm not a good roommate, I guess. I, I flicked it away. <gasps> I didn't oh, squish it. I didn't okay. squish it. I didn't kill spider. All right. But I didn't want to hang out either. I'm ve I'm yeah. not that kind of a roommate. Um, Did I yeah. have, have I told you about um my spider propane palace mm -mm. adventure? No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh some friends uh and and I we had rented a uh rented a couple of houses and this little cute little property in Big Sur. And there was one of the places on the property for people to stay was a, like a fixed up little RV. And it was this cute little RV camper thingy. And so that was where my friend was going to sleep. And in the evening when she was going to head over there to sleep, I was like, oh, I'll go with you and I'll check. And we get out there and the whole thing Smells like gas. Smells like oh. propane. <laughs> we're oh. just like, open the door and we're just like, that's kind of, that's, hmm, that's not good. Let's just let it air out. And it's cold. And so we're like, oh, it's going to be cold. And you don't want to turn on the heater if it smells like propane. And we're just like, what if we, what if we, what have we got in here? And I was like, huh, well, at least it's clean and there's no spiders. And she starts laughing and she's like, yeah, yeah, no spiders. I don't see those any, anywhere. And so I jokingly go back to the bed that had been made in the back of the camper. And I'm like, ha, ha, ha. And I pull the blankets out and like throw them open. And I like give a sweep of my hand through the blankets and this giant spider is like, it was like that big around with its legs and everything. It was a big brown spider comes scuttling out of the blankets. And I <laughs> and we died. We're <gasps> burn it down. It smells like propane. We can light it on fire right now. <laughs> no. No. Oh, no. Did you sleep in that bed? Nope. No, nobody slept there. <laughs> 
Nobody slept in the spider propane palace. That was done. Yeah. And we hey, asked for I, a partial refund. Yeah. I was, I was already out no. at propane. The spider wouldn't have freaked me out as much as the propane smell. That, that would have been the deal killer right out. there. I was like, that spider's too big. Nope. Get it out of my bed. <laughs> yeah. Not okay. Not rooming with the spider. No, I didn't pay can, to have I a spider it. roommate. Go if outside. It. <laughs> it was like, ah, spider. Too no big. spider roommate. Spider neighbor. <laughs> Spider mm, propane palace. <laughs> Too much. So anyway, we're staying in a nice Airbnb next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right next to the convention center. Oh, nice. Which will be fantastic. I have to send you guys the details on that. I haven't done uh, that yet, have I? Have I done that? You, you invited me to an Airbnb. I did yep. invite you. Okay. Uh -huh. So do you both have the details? I have, I have the both. address. I don't know that I've Why got the... Address? I didn't check if I've got the key code. Okay. Yeah. Key I, they code. usually don't send you the key code until like the day you're supposed to check in. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then on... So we'll get there Thursday. Justin, you're getting there earlier? I'll be there a day earlier. Yes. But not staying because I couldn't get it get that done um yeah so we'll get in thursday there is a science writery thing there's like there's all sorts of things going on but there is friday night is the podcaster meetup mm -hmm. and that is, i can mm -hmm. send you the details to that if i haven't done that yet I've, i think we both have that Yes, Justin and I okay. signed up already. Okay, but, good. Yeah, but you didn't RSVP yet. I noticed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't. No, no, you're not on the list. No, I you're swear not coming. I did. No, yeah. you're not there. What? Yeah. I swear I did that. I hit the button. Maybe I hit one button and then didn't. Yeah, I do. Extra I button. Am, oh, maybe. I have been extremely ADD with lots of things going on this lately. Mm. This month. Um, can I? Can I message our, this host? Uh, I think I can. Right. I just want to see. What do you want to do? Well, because we get in before check-in, and sometimes oh, with Airbnbs, they'll let you drop off the, your stuff early. Hmm. Oh. I don't think it's okay. I don't think I can mess. You don't think you shouldn't them. speak. It's my philosophy. Rude. Whoa, there. <laughs> <look at> <laughs> I think my cat just pulled off. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Kiki's oh, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've met a lot of cats that can, uh, that can shake. You're talking about trying to train a dog to shake hands. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of cats that'll do it, mm. only they'll claw and bite at the same time. Sadie's still biting my hand when she's shaking. She's, I, I've decided she's part cat for sure. I mean, yeah. she's asleep not on much the arm bigger. of the couch right now. Not much, yeah, not much bigger than so, that. So here, let's see if I can show. <laughs> if I can show you. Um, there oh, she is. There's a cat. Oh my oh. goodness! She's Are on the arm of the couch. Dog oh, on the arm of the couch. Cappy, come here. What are you doing? Here we go. I'm messing with my camera. You want attention, but you don't want to get on my lap, huh, animal? Animal. We have to download an app to get the entry oh. code, it says. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, there's an oh. app for the uh, AAAS conference, by the way. Yes, uh, there is. But apparently, is. The, uh, apparently the app only shows us as having one uh, venue, not two. The program oh, the shows two, but the app apparently only shows one. Uh, yeah, so I uh, asked, uh, it was originally even in the program, only the Friday yeah. show was in the schedule, and then I didn't see the Saturday show, and so I uh, contacted them about that, and they said that it was fixed. Okay, so, so it's, it's fixed on the program. In, it's fixed in the program. Missing in the app. app. Yep. Okay. For whatever. Whatever uh, reason. Yeah. Okay, Interesting. Batman camera work. That's right. Thanks, Noodles. Mm. Cappy, you're a born camera cat. That's right. You're camera operator kitty cat, aren't you? Yep. 
Um, no. Yeah, so we'll get those details for uh, for the staying and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I need to... And we, you guys are going to the podcast meetup. I guess I'm not. No, you can still <laughs> sign up. Also, I'm sure you can go. I'm sure no one cares. I'm For sure, sh- like, what do you they, mean? they'd be happy to see you. Wait, what do you Actually, mean? they'd be happier to be? see you, I think. Of course, yeah. they're going to be happy to see me. No, That's what I'm saying. Happy. Yeah. I'm, say- I'm saying nobody cares whether you've RSVP'd, is what I said. Just show up. <laughs> Not nobody cares if you show up. That would yeah. be a weird mean thing be for happy. me to say. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wow, Blair really very so rude just rude. now. <laughs> oh my god. That's really that's not a normal thing <laughs> that she would say. Why are you being so rude? No. Nope. Jeez. Um yeah, but I was going to say that if we wanted to do a um a meetup. That what we could do is maybe at the same place, like the hour ahead of that, just go there an hour early. Mm-hmm. And people, if they're in the Seattle area, can meet us there. Okay. Right? The other thing is that is, if that. I'm not mistaken, uh, Valentine's Day. Mm-hmm. Sure right. is. Uh, so if we were... Okay. I'm just saying, uh, yeah. if we want, Kiki has to... important Valentine's business to get to <laughs> all by yourself. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I'm what I'm actually referring to is if we have uh, some faithful minions who would like to meet up with us, they might have significant others, and while they would probably make a convincing uh, rationale for spending their Valentine's Day with their significant other, also hanging out with us, uh, you know, maybe we could, should hang out with them on a different day. When do you get in, Kiki? Um, Thursday. Do you want to do Thursday night, mm-hmm. or do we want to be prepping instead? I, I think have we could prep another, after. A, I have another event on Thursday mm-hmm. night. Mm-hmm. What about Saturday <clears throat> afternoon? We could also do Saturday afternoon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This might be fun to meet during a happy mm-hmm. hour. Yeah, I really want to go to Marin <clears throat> McKenna's keynote, which mm-hmm. is at 515. She mm-hmm. wrote Big Chicken. I'd like to get her on the show. Mm-hmm. She is um, Her specialty is writing about uh, infectious disease. And she's a... She's done some amazing writing and reporting, and it would be amazing. I just, I would love to see her keynote. Um, There's all sorts of things. But there is this window between 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock on Friday the 14th. Mm -hmm. That might be. Yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, between 6 and 7, there's this hour between 6 and 7 where... I have a, I'm meeting up with some people from 5 to 6 p.m. And we can either, I can stay there at that location, which is we'll in the hotel. We'll just take over the joint. We'll just take over which, the joint. Which is in the hotel at a wine bar. Mm. Or I can leave that location and go to the location where the podcaster meetup is and we can mm-hmm. just be there early. Mm. Would you rather have, which is a McMinimins? So that would be either beer or pub food, wine bar. I think the McMinimins pub food. Yeah, pub food. I would think the McMinimins. Yeah, Yeah. probably. It's probably easier. Uh, It's on my calendar. How come I'm. I can't even find your name on it. I can't even find the email. <laughs> you want me to forward it to you? you send me the email? I have yeah. no idea. Just Google oh, RSVP no. in your uh, email. Google. Yeah. Oh, it might come up. I have no idea. I don't see anything. Here. I don't have it's it. It's not from AAAS. I think that's why from just a person's name. 
Ed, that's right. But I said no one cares if I just show up. That's right. Security will just walk me away. I know. I know. They'll just walk me right out of there. Did you find it, Blair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just forwarded it to you. Okay. I forwarded it to you, right? Or did they forward no, it to you? No, they sent it to me. Oh, interesting. Oh, I guess uh, my RSVP. How, Justin, how did you make yours for two? I hmm? RSVP'd. You what do you mean? You were RSVP'd for two people? Who RSVP'd? Yeah, can you see that? I just yeah. said in the, in the comments, I just said me plus one. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, it's very I'm low. Showing time. up with a plus one. Is it an evite? No. No, it's a paperless post. I just forwarded oh. it to you. It um it's from Ashira. Yeah, Ashira. I don't know. Paper there's paperless media. Ashira. It's called oh, Podcasters God. Happy Hour in Seattle. In Seattle. There it is. Oh. Okay, look at me viewing and replying and RS. Uh, yeah, I never looked at this. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. You know, like, yeah, what? Uh, what is this? I, I, so I've noticed, and we've gone to that comment, and this is, this is I have no idea uh, that we have a new generous sponsor. What? Yeah. This is our new generous Burroughs Welcome Fund. Yes. Okay, so it must be the I William have... S. Burroughs, and it has to do something with uh, <laughs> the haikus that we keep people asking people to send in. Some sort of poetics. Right. It's poetic. Yes, the Bur <laughs> William S. Burroughs poetic. No, um, so it there is a the Burroughs, the Welcome Trust. The Burroughs Welcome Trust is a foundation in the UK, and then there was. Some money from that split off and brought over here to the United States, and it is a, um, a they're a foundation, a fund that uh, they uh, they fund some science communication efforts, and they but their main thrust is to um, support biomedical and bioscience research, and so they have a lot of uh, early career researcher uh, grants and support. Um, and very specialized support for scientists and researchers. Nice. Uh, yeah, they do good stuff. They 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 support some really good really good people doing really obviously, good work. obviously, obviously, yeah, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. And they're they're helping us go to Seattle. <laughs> oh, well, I'm glad they found us. Nice. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's wonderful, and I'm. Absolutely, absolutely thrilled to be able to say thank you to them on the show. It's very important. Who are you looking for, Sadie? Did you lose mm -hmm. Sadie? I lost her. She's she chewing the on couch? some furniture. <laughs> <laughs> She's chewing on her couch. What's going on there? Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, okay, hold every on, hold on. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Um, so, Blair. Yes. Newsletter. We will do af your your plan mm -hmm. in an after AAAS. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. I will work on something between then. And we just now. need to take some photos as well when we're all together. Yeah, that would be good. We didn't. We can include the San Francisco togetherness because mm -hmm. we have yeah. a couple of photos of that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so that'll be good. Photos. I love photos. We can tell the story. Tell the tale of San Francisco. A tale of two cities. San mm -hmm. Francisco and Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we have nothing. Okay. Um, but I have not put down anything for the rundown for the show for next week. Mm -hmm. so we'll work on getting that stuff in there. Um... I made some slight changes to today's rundown. Mm -hmm. Everything cool on your ends? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. what? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that was good. Um, are we bringing the same number of stories cumulatively over the two days since we're doing some interviews and the shows are just an hour, right? The, the it, We have an hour and a half total. The first show is an hour. The second is only a half hour. Oh, it's only a half an hour. Okay, so... Yeah. so 
same number, maybe less stories, and then we'll have some. Then we'll have some interviews. Yeah. Um, okay. okay. That's yeah. All. What I would love to do is get a couple of interviews, um, but they won't be long interviews. They'll have to be like mm -hmm. twenty-minute interviews or something like that. We can. Mm -hmm. Uh, either split it up so that we have like stories and then one interview on Friday and do mm -hmm. basically just one interview on Saturday if we do in, like just make it an interview show or mm -hmm. or we can do I mean because we're there we can get yeah. scientists it's, so it's an opportunity I would I would suggest that we try to go as 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 much interview heavy yeah. uh, even if we did all interviews I think that's the perfect location to go and seek out people and bring them in yeah. And talk to them. I mean, that's it, and, and and it's sad that we only have an hour and a half. I feel like this yes. is one of those venues we could do four hours one day, four hours another, if we got enough uh, participation from the attending scientists, which probably won't be too hard. Which is no. why I feel like we should be able to steal some more airtime, do some more interviews. Yeah. Um, I it's one so. of those. It's one of those places where you can walk through and see a poster or something that you mm -hmm. know that somebody's got. And be like you, an hour from now, follow me. Like just go grab people, bring them in, mm -hmm. and just have these conversations because it's going to be, uh, it's going to be wonderful. Then. It's going to be so yeah. fun. Yeah, it's going to be know. super fun. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's get ready for a fun time. Mm -hmm. um, we will tentatively then talk about, so this is, uh, for those of you listening right now, watching right now. Listening to the logistics. Uh, the logistics, the six o'clock next Friday at McMiniman's Six Arms. Let's, let's meet each other and have a beer and some pub snacks, <laughs> whatever those are. I know McMinimins often has very good tater tots. Oh. Mm. Although I've never heard of McMinimins. It's a big thing up here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. The McMinimins brothers, they buy these like old places, like schools and hospitals and like old places and they rebuild them and turn them mm. into hotels and restaurants and mm. bars. And like the places are amazing and they just they've got so much they just, they're really cool places to hang out. Unfortunately, the food is like Cisco food and the beer is okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's not like the Really best. selling it. I it the places are usually the places are amazing. It makes you it usually makes you, it's fine. It's fine. Oh no. Oh no. We have the zoomies. Uh-oh. The zoomies, your dog's going zoom. All right. Uh okay. Blair? But anyway. Blair? Yes. Have don't a good night, singing your, saw guy. Check your bed for spiders. Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Yo, say good night, Blair. Where you were going? Sorry. Uh, wait. Are we? Do we have to discuss anything else about next week? I guess not, huh? We're good. Do we? Um, no, because I will try and get the run sheets together. We will uh, get a couple of interviews, mm -hmm. and <laughs> then I think we'll be fine. <laughs> Zoomy zoomy dogs. <laughs> I've got a meowy cat. You've got a zoomy dog. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad you. I'm glad you kept this on the air longer, Blair. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Hey Blair. Hey Blair. Hey Blair. Hey Blair. Say, Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. <laughs> Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We'll be in Seattle next week. If you're there, too, I hope we get to see you. Have a wonderful week. Bye. Why are you punching? You're so strong. <laughs>